and sunbeams from heaven are what I can see. When my Lord is living in me, I know that Jesus is well and alive today. He makes his home in my heart. Nevermore will I be all alone since he promised me that we never would part. Green grass and flowers all blooming in springtime are works of the Master. I live for each day. I know that Jesus is well and alive today. He makes his home in my heart. Nevermore will I be all alone since he promised me that we never would part. Tall mountains, green valleys, the beauty that surrounds me all makes me aware of the one who made it all. I know that Jesus is well and alive today. He makes his home in my heart. Good morning, church. I don't know about you, but it was cold enough for me this morning. I think this is it, though. We're going to turn the corner and spring is here. That's what I'm wanting to believe. Number 218, in moments like these. In moments like these, I sing out a song. I sing out a love song to Jesus. In moments like these, I lift up my voice, I lift up my voice to the Lord, singing I Signal Mountain. It's always good for God's people to be together. As we open our, our worship this morning, I want to read a couple of verses from Psalm chapter 18. Psalm chapter 118, I'm sorry, 118, starting in verse 19. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day 
that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Let's pray as we continue our worship. Our Father, our God, our Creator, we are grateful to be called your sons and daughters. We're grateful to be adopted into your family. We're grateful and just blown away by the redemption that you have brought through your Son, through our Messiah, Jesus Christ. We pray that our worship will be uplifting, will be encouraging to us, and will, will be an acceptable, sweet sacrifice to you. Lord, we love you, we need you, and we ask for your hand and your, your spirit to move in our spirit to change us, to, to conform us to your will and not to our own. Father, we are grateful. We thank you. And we lift this prayer up through the power of the resurrected Messiah. Amen. If it's convenient for you, will you stand and sing number two with me? Let's all sing out. Number two. Hallelujah. Praise Jehovah. From the heavens, praise his name. Praise Jehovah in the highest. All his angels praise proclaim. All his souls together praise him. Sun and moon and stars on high. Praise him, O ye have not heavens and floods above the sky. Let them pray. Oh. 
When Jesus was assembled with his apostles in that upper room before his death, he said this. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. And gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you to do this in remembrance of me. And then in 1 Corinthians, Apostle Paul, almost verbatim, repeats this. And he says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And we said, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. The Lord's Supper that we're about to partake, uh, when Jesus was in that upper room, it wasn't just for that evening for his apostles and for himself. It's for all of us, every time we come together to partake of this meal. And what did, what did Jesus ask us to do? He asked us to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Very simple, but very profound. And why did he ask us to do that? He said, do this in remembrance of me. So when we partake of, of this supper this morning, let's remember Jesus. Let's remember his sacrificial death, his burial, in his resurrection, that he overcame death, he overcame Satan, and it gives us hope that someday we will reign with him forever. Let us pray. Father, we do remember you. We remember your sacrifice. We remember what you did for us through your amazing love that you cared enough about us uh, that you reunited us with, with God himself. This morning as we partake of the bread, help us to remember that that is your body that you sacrificed for us. We do this in, in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we continue this memorial, as we again remember Christ, His sacrifice, the blood that He shed on the cross for us. We can't thank You enough for sending Your Son to die in our stead, to take our sins upon Himself, so that we may be reconciled to You and that we can live with You forever in eternity in heaven. Again, what love, what greater love was shown towards us. We thank you and we're blessed because of it. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. This time, let us give give thanks for the many material blessings that we've been bestowed. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we give you thanks this morning for allowing us to be here to enjoy this worship and fellowship with one another. But help us to remember that you have blessed us so tremendously with material things, and I'm so grateful for this congregation for the generosity uh, in meeting all sorts of needs that uh, this church has. And I ask your continued blessings upon us that we may continue to, to give and to, and to serve and to help others. And as we give this morning, help us to do so with hearts of gratitude and thankfulness and help us to realize that all good things come from you. And we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Mark number 33, that'll be our invitation hymn after the sermon. But at this time, we're going to stand and sing number 260, if you'll stand with me. Oh, worship the King of glory. Bountiful care, what tongue can recite? 
Today I'll be reading Hebrews 3, verse 7 through 13. So as the Holy Spirit says, today if you are not, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. During the time of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested and tried me, though for forty years they saw what I did. This is why I was angry with that generation. I said, Their hearts are always going astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declared an oath on my anger, they shall never enter my rest. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for this time that we've been able to come together as a congregation and worship you. Please help our worship to be pleasing in your sight. Please help us to grow stronger as brothers and sisters today. Please help us to open our hearts to Greg's message today. In Jesus' name, amen. you will and thank you Matt for the songs uh, what what's it called when a basketball team loses the NCAA division one tournament what's it called when a basketball team loses the NCAA division number division one tournament March sadness <laughs> Okay, let's turn to our lesson today. I was an honor. Matt and I have a little thing going there. He's done some good. Okay, it's revivals. Who needs them? In the book of Hebrews, the entire book of Hebrews, I don't know if you know this, is, it is a call for revival. The whole book. It's a second generation away from the generation that received the gospel. There's been some time pass. And he tells them, remember the way it was when you first got this message. He's calling the generation that followed to that same passion that the first generation held. Uh, call for revival. How many of us grew up with what we call gospel meetings? Raise your hand if you know what a gospel meeting is. Gospel meeting. Gospel meetings, usually, when I was growing up, a guest speaker would come. And it was almost always, in my growing up, seven days long. Our church family would have at least one a year, and we would meet every evening, Monday through Sunday, and we would even make flyers like the one you see here and go around the neighbors to invite people to come join us. People would do it. That was before all this TV stuff that we have. The Taft Highway Church of Christ just up the road still does these. What we called gospel meetings, our neighboring denomination called revivals. Revivals. Um, we didn't call them revivals because they did, partly. <laughs> there were some really big revivals called campaigns. Sometimes crowds numbering thousands would gather for these, even filling big stadiums. Some of you may remember in the 1990s what was called the Promise Keepers movement would fill huge football fields all over the nation and they would be in those stands all day long, all day long. Big gatherings still go on. Today we have huge events like the CYC. How many of you were there? Okay, we got some folks' hands there. That was a big, big meeting together, a campaign, if you will. Uh, and also uh, polishing the pulpit or lads to leaders. These are still places where there are thousands of people coming together lasting two to three days sometimes, staying overnights and so on. And people, people tend to be drawn to huge gatherings that meet with a common cause. Deep within us all, there seems to be this attraction for a common cause that we can all rally around. Would you not agree with that? Is it any wonder then that Satan takes advantage of this longing and twists it? for selfish or sinful or deceptive purposes. A lot of rallies happen, we'd say they're neutral, but a lot of them are not neutral. Let's say like a, a big political rally. But then comes the gay pride parades or the protest marches which are against good things. 
And these gatherings, events, draw crowds to a common cause. They tend to have a slogan, a slogan that stands out, right? What is our slogan as the body of Christ? What's, what's our, we're marching for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, what's our kingdom slogan? If you had to make one up, what would you say it is? Well, our slogan, I believe, should be the same one that Jesus Christ and right before Him, John the Baptist, proclaimed. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. In our lesson today in our adult Bible class, we were in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and the appeal that God makes through His people is this. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. That's our message. That's our slogan. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. Should that message be revived today? Do you think? Will it draw people to revival? Will it draw them? Why or why not? Are revival something that we can plan and put together? Or are they spontaneous Holy Spirit-led bursts of spiritual awakening? We need to know what the Bible says about these things. Our theme this year, selected by our elders, is this. Revival and resurrection. That's our theme. This two-part theme is as biblical as anything we've ever done. And I hope, as we take time to go through God's Word on this, God will reveal to us what He wants in these ways and how we can be part of a grand, holy revival, both in our own hearts and hopefully one that will catch attention and be contagious to others. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at some of the kings of Israel and Judah uh, in the Davidic kingdom, in the history of the Old Testament. And during this period, several years, a few hundred years in fact, we see several examples of revival. Stopping right there, I just want to thank Kendall for filling in last week for me. I saw this lesson, it was great. I hope you were here. The comparison of Saul and David in their hearts and how God looks for those who will be revived. Saul needed revival, but he didn't ever get it, did he? He never accepted it. David needed revival too, and what happened to him? He embraced it. He embraced it and wrote about it for us. This period... Uh, sometimes the revivals would take deep roots and they would outlast the king who led them. And others, they were like a, a kind of flare in the night that shone brightly for a little while and burned out and the darkness would return. Idolatry would come back, sometimes with a vengeance. Sort of like our 9-11-01 revival where the, ten, where the, the twin towers fell. I remember being here, we put a sign on the, just I spray painted a sheet, open for prayer. We hung it on the sign out on both sides. People were coming in off the streets, parking, coming into our church building all day long. 9-11, 01. And we were doing cycles of just, we'd pray, we'd look at Scripture, we'd talk about it, discuss it, and more people come in, we'd start all over again. Pray, look at Scripture, talk about it. That revival lasted for almost a month. Right? Revival. Revivals bring new life, but the newness can wear off. The church in Ephesus in Revelation 2, we need to remember and heed the word of Jesus. Repent and return to your first love. That's what revival sort of does for us. Some marriages need revival. You know, families sometimes need revival. How many of us need revival? I know I do, over and over again. Sometimes a revival, uh, it, it, it's like a kingdom hunger or spiritual hunger. Uh, did I put that on there? New Testament revivals, there we go. 
It's a, it, it's a spiritual hunger that occurs when we're distant from the nourishing presence of God and we realize it. And it, it kind of breaks out in this, this awareness and a calling on God, a, a prayer and worship experience. And uh, then comes this feast of reunion with Him and worship and repentance and recommitment and celebration. If biblical history is any indicator, the church, the church regularly needs revivals, needs recharges, needs restorations, needs renewals, needs returns, needs repentance. It's a constant need for us. We're like a device that regularly needs to be recharged. What percentage of power are we running on today, would you say, as a church? Are we 100% full and tapped out? Or are we weak? Are we getting down to the red mark? Where are you personally in your own life? Have you ever had a phone die on you in the middle of something important? I was in Nashville trying to get away from, uh, from Vanderbilt Hospital and get back to where I needed to go, and my phone was down to 1%. <laughs> and the map showed what to do, and I'm going, I've got to find somewhere I'm familiar with as quick as I possibly can. At that point, that's the first time I'd been there, a long time ago. Uh, have you ever forgotten to recharge your electronic device and regretted it? Okay. You know what? God's Word has a lot to say about this. Ephesians 5.19 says, Do not get drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery, but be filled with what? Fill with the Spirit. It's almost like renew. He's already told us in chapter 1 that we're sealed by the Spirit. Chapter 2, that we are indwelled by the Spirit. Chapter 3, we're empowered by the Spirit. And he gets to chapter 5 and he says, be filled with the Spirit. You know why we need to be filled with the Spirit? Because we leak. We leak. In Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 6, Paul writes to Timothy and says, Fan into flame the gift of God given you by the laying on of my hands. God didn't give us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and self-discipline. Timothy, get that thing going again. Revive. Jesus told the church at Ephesus, I mentioned earlier, they had left their first love. Repent and do the deeds you did at first. Revival of love. These our scriptures calling us to awareness of our regular need for revival. And our relationships with God need to be fed by regular recharging in the Word. Worship, fellowship, giving, prayer, and yes, fasting. Fasting is a good way to say no to something you want to get yes on something that you need. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58 summarizes the main point of the entire book of Hebrews. It says, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For you know your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Why does he have to say those words? Because it's easy to lose that steadfastness. It's easy to be movable. It's easy to stop abounding in the work of the Lord. Get tired and forget. There's a great reward for those who keep on keeping on, but there's also a great reward for those who just keep being recharged and come back. All of us have this sort of a cycle. Hopefully we're working our way up. The power to live the Christian life is not in ourselves. It's from God. The power is in God. We must be recharged regularly, revived by His strength. Why do you come to church every Sunday? Why? Is it just so you can say, I did it? Is it just to obey a principle? It's supposed to be a recharge. It's supposed to be a renewal. Our biblical example today is in Asa. I'm going to go back to this. We started a couple of weeks ago. Asa both encourages me and disappoints me. And from him we learn a lot about revival. So go in your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 14. I'm just going to read the text God's word is the best word, right? Let's hear it. Asa, verse 2, 2 Chronicles 14. Not 2 Corinthians. 2 Chronicles 
First, Second Kings, First, Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles 14.2. Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. He removed the foreign altars and the high places, smashed the sacred stones, cut down the Asherah poles. He commanded Judah to seek the Lord, the God of their fathers, and to obey his laws and commands. That's so important. He commanded them, seek God, obey God. He removed the high places, the incense altars in every town in Judah. And the kingdom was at peace with, under him. He built up fortified cities in Judah since the land was at peace. No one was at war with him during those years. For the Lord gave him rest. He turned to God and God gave him rest. And he began to rebuild areas and fortify them because he knew, guess what? Peace won't last, but the power of God will. Let us rebuild up these towns, he said, and put walls around them with towers and bars and gates. The land is still ours because we've sought the Lord our God. We have sought Him, and He has given us rest on every side. So they built and they prospered. Asa recognized it's God who gave us this. Let's use it for His glory. Verse 8, Asa had a, an army of 300,000 men of Judah equipped with large shields and spears, 280,000 from Benjamin armed with small shields and bows. All these were brave fighting men. But look what happens in chapter 9. Okay, peace has been for 10 years. Now Zira the Cushite marches out against them with a vast army. Vast army with thousands upon thousands. An army of a million people at least. And 300 chariots, those are tanks of those days. They came as far as Merashah. Asa went out to meet him. And they took the battle positions in the valley of Zephathoth and near Merashah. And then Asa called on the Lord his God and said, Lord, there's no one like you to help the powerless against the mighty. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rely on you. In your name we've come against this vast army. O Lord, you are the... Our God, do not let man prevail against you. And what happened? The Lord struck down the Cushites before Asa and Judah. The Cushites fled. Asa and his army pursued them as far as Gerar. And such a great number of Cushites fell, they could not recover. They were crushed before the Lord and his forces. The men of Judah carried off a large amount of plunder. They destroyed all the villages of Gerar, for the terror of the Lord had fallen upon them. They plundered all these villages since there was so much booty there. They attacked the camps of the herdsmen and carried off droves of sheep and goats and camels. And they returned to Jerusalem. And on their way back to Jerusalem, the Spirit of God came upon, chapter 15, verse 1, the, the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded. He went out to meet Asa and said to him, Listen to me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you when you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. They were, for, they were seeking him. But, here's a warning, if you forsake him, what? He will forsake you. You may not like that part, but it's in our Bibles. For a long time, Israel was without a, the true God, without a priest to teach without the law. A long time? Yeah, Solomon, Rehoboam, and Abijah. Those three, Solomon in his idolatry, Rehoboam continued it, Abijah continued it. There have been four generations of this. In their distress, they turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought Him, and He was found by them. In those days, it was not safe to travel about. The inhabitants of the lands were in great turmoil. One nation was being crushed by another, one city by another, because God was troubling them with every kind of distress. Why were the cities and the nations against each other? Because God was doing what? God was troubling them. Why do you think our world's in such turmoil today? Who's doing that? You think we're doing that? You think China's doing that? You think Russia's doing that? How about if God's doing that? Do you know over a billion babies have been killed before they were ever born? Who's going to answer for that blood? Who do you think? That's just one thing. We've got gay pride parades everywhere there's any kind of Western society. What do you think about that? You think that's great? I think that's sin. God's Word is plain on those things. But as for you, Asa, be strong. Do not give up. Your work will be rewarded. Sounds a lot like 1 Corinthians 15, 58. 
Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Azariah, the son of Oded, the prophet, and he took courage. The word of God came, his heart was open to it. He removed the detestable idols from the whole land of Judah and Benjamin and from the towns he'd captured in the hills of Ephraim. He repaired the altar of the Lord that was in front of the portico of the Lord's temple. He assembled all Judah and Benjamin and the people from Ephraim, Manasseh, and Simeon and he, that settled among them. And a large number had come over to him from Israel when they saw the Lord as God was on his side. When, you, when people see God on our side, it tends to be attractive to some people who want him. If we don't show that God is on our side, people aren't attracted to it. They assembled at Jerusalem in the third month of the 15th year of Asa's reign. He's been, he's been king for 15 years now. At that time, they sacrificed to the Lord 700 head of cattle, 7,000 sheep and goats from the plunder they brought back, and they entered into a covenant to seek, again, seek the Lord, the God of their fathers, with all their heart and their soul. Seeking God. Hebrews says the Lord rewards those who diligently seek Him. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. All who would not seek the Lord, the God of Israel, were to be put to death. Okay, there you go. I think that got some of them attention. Whether small or great, woman or man. They took an oath to the Lord with loud acclamation, with shouting, with trumpets and horns. And all Judah rejoiced about the oath. They had sworn it wholeheartedly. They sought God eagerly. And he was found by them. Huge revival. So the Lord gave them rest on every side. The king also deposed his grandmother Maaka from her position as queen mother because she had made a repulsive Asherah pole. His grandma he takes down. Why? She's got an idol going. And he tore it down. He cut the pole down, broke it up, burned it in the valley of Kidron. Although he did not remove the high places from Israel, Asa's heart was fully committed to the Lord. It says, mine says, all his life. We're going to see at the end what really happened. He brought into the temple of God the silver, the gold, the articles he and his father dedicated, and there was no more war for 30 until the 35th year of Asa's reign. 20 years of peace. 10 years first, 20 years next. In the 36th year of Asa's reign, Basha, king of Israel, went up against Judah and fortified Ramah to prevent anyone from leaving or entering the territory of Asa, king of Judah. Asa, what did he do? What did Asa do here? I'm in chapter 16, verse 2. What did he do here? Asa took the silver and gold out of the treasuries of the Lord's temple and of his own palace and sent them to Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, who was ruling in Damascus. And he says to this king, let's, let's do it politically. Let's have a diplomatic way of dealing with this or a political way of dealing with this. Let there be a treaty between me and you as there's been between my father and your father. I'm sending you silver and gold. Now break your treaty with Basha, king of Israel, so he'll withdraw from me. Ben-Hadad agreed with King Asa, sent the commanders of his forces against the towns of Israel, and they conquered Ijon, Dan, Abel, Maom, and there were all the store cities of Naphtali. The northern part of Israel was just banged on. When Basha, the king of Israel, heard this, he stopped building Ramah and he abandoned his work, and the king of Asa brought all the men of Judah. They carried away from Ramah stones and timber that Basha had been using, and he built up Gibeah and Mizpah. At that time... Now, what did, what did Asa just do? What did Asa just do? He leaned on himself and his own resources. That's what he did. And he made peace with this king who was a pagan king of Aram, an idolatrous king of Aram, to try to get him to stop this idolatrous king of the north. Okay, that's what he did. He, he, and he took money out of the treasury of God and his own treasury to, to make it happen. Smart move, right? And it worked, didn't it? And he's feeling pretty good about himself. Hey, this is looking good. This worked out great. Verse 7. At that time, Hananiah the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, Because you relied on the king of Aram and not on the Lord your God, the army of the king of Aram has escaped your hand. Were not the Cushites and the Libyans a mighty army with great numbers of chariots and horsemen? Yet when you relied on the Lord, He delivered them into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout there. See, God is seeking those who are seeking Him. The eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. 
Jesus said it in John 4. God is seeking those who worship Him in spirit and in truth. This is the worshipers God seeks. But by Asa, you've done a foolish thing. From now on, you're going to be at war. Look at verse 10. The first time a prophet talked to Asa, Asa was, took courage and obeyed. This time, Asa was angry with the seer because of this. He was so enraged, he put him in, in prison. At the same time, Asa brutally oppressed some of the people. The events of Asa's reign from beginning to end are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. In the 39th year of his reign, four years later, King Asa was afflicted with a disease in his feet. Though this disease was severe, even in his illness, he did not seek help from the Lord, only from the physicians. Then in the 41st year of his reign, Asa died and rested with his fathers. Four generations had brought idolatry and embedded it in Judah's culture and religious practice. Solomon finished poorly. Rehoboam followed suit. Abijah continued the corruption. And then came Asa. Asa was aware of the condition of his people and he began to seek God. And what happened? Revival came. Revival came. And he called everyone else and he commanded them, seek God and obey Him. And revival came. And with it came the blessing of God's peace. Asa's faith revival in that time had two major sections. When Asa took the throne, he sought the Lord, the God of his father. That's Father David. He did what was good in the eyes of the Lord. I'm not clicking here. I should be. Is that right? Yeah. Aware of our condition. That's the first thing we need to learn. The second is... Seeking God and doing some house cleaning. <laughs> the second thing he did, as he sought God, he began to tear down all the idols and get rid of them, cast them all out, and to repair the house of God and restore the worship. Restore the worship of God. Revivals start with this awareness of our condition, our great need for recharge and a relationship with God, and that calls for demolition. House cleaning. God's hands work to wreck that which is evil and to restore that which is good. And our hands need to do like His. Revival replaces the garbage of idolatry with seeking the Lord and doing what God says. And after the demolition comes this renewal and rededication, restoring worship, returning to God's will and God's ways. That was the ways that Asa did it. And then God gave Judah 10 years of rest from their enemies. Asa saw this as a time of repairing and restoring, getting ready for enemy attacks, chapter 14, verse 7. And when the enemy came, the enemy does attack, doesn't it? I mean, when you do what God wants, you're going to get some people who are going to be real excited about it, but not everybody's going to be excited about it. And those that aren't, if you're strong enough and you do enough, you're going to get a lot of attacks for being what you need to be. And the attacks came. Evil responds to revival. You've got to remember that. Revivals tend to raise the head of the serpent and make him bear his fangs. So get ready. In Ephesians 6 verse 10 and following, we realize our battle's not against flesh and blood. It's against principalities and powers, world forces of evil in heavenly places, spiritual forces of darkness. We are in a spiritual battle, brothers and sisters, and it is upon us. When we walk with God, we must also remember that attacks will come because we are at war. And therefore, we arm ourselves with the armor of God in order we can resist the flaming darts of the evil one. Revival is not the conclusion. It is the resurrection of devotion to God. Staying faithful, ongoing revivals of loving God, loving others, seeking, saving, serving. This is what we need to stay the course. A few years ago, for three years, we went through our mission statement. Do you remember that, those of you who are here? We went a whole year looking at where is God seeking us? And read our whole Bibles all the way through, looking for the, the seeking 
of the King of, of Heaven. And He seeks us. He seeks the lost. He seeks us, doesn't He? He's looking. What is God looking for? What is He seeking? So we can do the same. We're to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, right? Our job is to seek Him. And when you're seeking, you see the King. I like that. And saving. Our God is a saving God. He loves to save. He sent His Son to die so He could save. God is a saving God. And we're to be a kind of people who are a saving people. He puts that in us so we can proclaim His Word and He can save those who hear and respond in faith and obedience. And our God is a serving God. We were a whole year looking at the serving God that we serve who serves us. Jesus washed the feet of His own disciples. And when He got to Judas, He washed His feet too. Revival is not the conclusion. It is the resurrection of devotion to God. It's a recharge of the dead batteries of faith, hope, and love. Revival is the restoration of the Spirit of God within the people of God to give them the power of God to prepare us to accomplish the purposes of God. Let me say it one more time. Revival is a restoration of the Spirit of God within the people of God to give them the power of God to prepare us to accomplish the purposes of God. Is that not true? You know, this congregation, this, it, we, we're kind of a new congregation from where we started. 1948, March 13th. 1948 was the first meeting of some people from other churches of Christ who lived on the mountain. They met together. Maupin. I don't, anybody know who the Mrs. Maupin? A couple of, Carol. Okay. That was one of the people who was one of the founding people that, that met in her house, I guess. Or his house. I don't even know. I saw Maupin. So it could be. I thought, you know, Maupin is usually, well, anyway. <laughs> group of Christians, they met on Signal Mountain to pray. And they asked God's help to plant a church here on this mountain. 1948. And we have the minutes of that meeting. And who was present in attendance. In fact, it's back in one of the closets back in the, uh, before you go into the main, uh, or the, uh, the big conference room, back over in the new section. Once they began to meet regularly for worship and Bible study and fellowship, they got a preacher. Rented a building out on Mississippi Avenue. If you go to Mississippi Avenue, you can still see that building. still there. By 1955, this property had been purchased and this property was a place where the building stopped. You guys in the annex, you'd be outside right now. This wall, you kind of see on the side of this wall, that is where the doorway was to go out. If you look carefully on that wall, you'll see new rocks where a window was. This annex was added in 1969 as a place because the church had grown, added an annex, and also an education wing. In 2000, I think it was seven, wasn't it? Somebody tell me, our addition down here, was it seven or four? Eight. Eight. Seven, eight. It was finished in eight, right? We started in seven, though, right? We started about 04, 05. Wow, okay. We came in, we moved into the place in 2008, though, right? I don't know if some of you remember, there was all these drapes. We all kind of packed into this side of the house while I was going on. That was interesting. It was exciting, but it was also kind of tough. Fellowship halls added, more classrooms added. This church has had 75 years in March of services. 75 years. That first generation who planned this church have almost all gone to glory. Almost all. We now carry the torch. We are here. How is our spiritual power level? How are we doing? Could we use a recharge? I think we could. And I pray God will give it to us. Would you join me in prayer for that? Holy and righteous Heavenly Father, as we come before your throne, we want to first praise you as the holy God who made all things, creating us in your own image and likeness. And then when we fell away from you into sin, you sent your Son as our Deliverer 
to die for us, to save us from our sins. And Father, because of your great love, through Jesus, you built the church. This assembly is part of that which you yourself have built. And we're to follow you, Lord, and we need you always. We are powerless in this world. As we look around us and see how it seems to be chaotic and, and in some places just totally falling apart, we know that you are sovereign over all, Lord, and so we call on you. We seek you. We turn to you, the God of all truth and comfort, the God who is God over all. And I would just want to pray this psalm. Answer us when we call to you, O God of our righteousness. Give us renewal. Give us revival. Be merciful and hear our prayer. As we look around us, we ask, how long will this world turn your glory into shame? How long will this world love delusions and seek false things and false gods? Help us, O oh Lord, to let the world know that we believe you have set us apart for yourself and that we will hear your voice and you hear ours when we call to you. Father, search our hearts. Know our thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in us. And lead us in the way everlasting. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. There are many who are asking who can show us any good. Father, let the light of your face shine upon us and fill our hearts with your joy and your strength so that we can walk in assurance and in peace and we can be revived again. Revive us, O Lord, for we are dead without you, but with you there is life, there is hope, there is assurance, there is eternal peace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're here today and you need to respond to God's call, and you want revival, you want help or strength from God, why don't you just come? Just come. Come on down. If you're not a Christian, you've never obeyed the gospel, you've never been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. He died for you. Will you accept that? Will you follow Him? If you need to, if you're ready to, do it now while we stand and sing to encourage you. Praise the O God for the Son.
shine upon you, be gracious to you. May the Lord lift His countenance upon us and give us His peace. May the Lord revive us. Give us fresh wind and fresh fire. Fresh Holy Spirit driven faith that will be pleasing to God and effective for His cause. In Jesus. Please be seated. Thank you for that lesson, Greg. I think we all pray earnestly and desperately for the need for revival. So thank you for that lesson this morning. I also appreciate Matt picking songs that uh, also uh, uh, follow that, that powerful idea. Uh, speaking of revival, let's talk about a few things that we have in front of us, that ways that we can get in plugged in this week. Uh, I guess I would call this uh, ways we could continue and call this March Gladness, maybe. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. But, but there, there are some ways that we would like to uh, uh, have opportunities this week to plug in uh, all, for, for all ages. The first is this afternoon at 4 o'clock. We've been looking forward to this event for quite some time. So please be here. Uh, Matt tells me that we're trying to pack 20,000 meals, and this is a it's, a, it's a great occasion to serve. It's also a great occasion for everyone to, to get involved and, and also to, to feed, to, to think about this, feed 20,000 people. Uh, if you have had, haven't had the opportunity, please go online and pre-register for that event. It would be a, a really good thing to do. Also, it will save time, I think, if, if, you, if you do that. Uh, also, we would re recommend, too, that you wear comfortable clothes. And Matt tells me also that uh, you can wear a cap. If you don't want to wear the, the hair nut, you can wear a ball cap, I think, and that will be fine. Have I covered everything, Matt? Sorry? Have I covered everything, I hope? Yeah. Okay. Pizza will be served afterwards? Okay, dinner will be served at. We have 45 who have signed up. Okay. Okay. So close to 75. Good. Okay, so everyone, uh, that's an exciting event. Also, just Wednesday night, just as a, as a reminder, uh, we urge you to come back. Uh, for those of you who, are, who don't regularly attend, it's a great time to plug in, revive, uh, to get encouraged. And we have an adult class where we're discussing Christian discipleship on Wednesday nights. The prime timers will have an outing on Friday at, at the Olive Garden, and the bus will leave the lower parking lot at 11 o'clock. That's on Friday this week. Uh, also next Sunday, Dorian Flynn will be here and talk about, give us an update. We all look forward to those, an update on the work in South Africa. So uh, we, we look forward to that as well. like to also uh, uh, give your attention to uh, the prayer requests in the bulletin today. Stephen Matheny, I'm glad, is back following his accident. Also, please remember Greg Nance and the passing of his uncle. Clark Cooper, Joyce Fear, Wanda Keesling, and Gilbert Jackson. Uh, also, let's remember those who are continuing to battle illnesses, uh, Bill Hill and Angie Maynard, uh, Gordon Mosley and Heath Smith. Also, prayers are requested for uh, Brian Dowling, who will be having surgery this Friday to remove a malignant kidney. Brian's been undergoing uh, treatments for some time and a decision is made to perform that surgery on fr Friday so please uh, your prayers are requested for Brian and Beth at this time. Birthdays this week Nick Foster I believe is the only person having a birthday this week so uh, that's he's, he's a special boy this week. Any other announcements? Let's go to God in, in closing prayer. Our Father, we're thankful for this period of time that we've had to be together this morning. We pray, Father, that uh, we have been encouraged. We pray that we've been drawn closer to You. 
And we just pray, Father, that you will guide us and help us uh, in, in this coming week that will be salt and light to the, those around us. In Jesus' name, amen.